Good evening. We are now in lecture 12 to the ends of the earth. The end of the first missionary era. By 1000, the West was largely converted to Christianity. The rest were inaccessible to Europe. The Nestorians, however, persisted in Persia and Mesopotamia. Reputedly, they have monasteries in China in the 8th century, allowed by the emperor as a kind of wisdom philosophy of sort. There were still Nestorian in China by 1200. The Mughals. The last marauding people were the Mughals under Genghis Khan, whose death is in 1227, whose dominion is from China to Hungary. In 1245, Innocent IV set Franciscan Archbishop Giovanni da Fian del Carpini, 1252, to ask the great Khan Kuyok in 1248 to cease, to cease slaughter of conquered peoples. Though moral and religious, the Mughals were given to extreme cruelty. Kuyok thought that their victories demonstrated that the gods did not favor the Christians. Louis IV sent emissaries to Khan, Fle Flemish Dominican William Robrock, 1293, in a formal debate, routed the politistic Buddhists. Kublai Khan asked Marco Polo for the Pope to send scholars to establish the truth of conflicting religious claims. Though not sent, Italian Francia John on, of Montecorbio in 1328, impressed Great Khan Timur and made some converts. He was made Archbishop at Beijing, but the mission lasted only the Mughals were con until the Mughals were conquered by the Ming Chinese in 1317. A new age of discovery. Due to the technological achievement of the Middle Ages, the general curiosity about the world sparked by the humanist spirit of the Renaissance. The religious currents spurred the interest in the wider world, including the Portuguese Prince Henry, the Navigator, 1460. He dreamt of new worlds to replace those lost to the Muslims. The Italian Christopher Columbus, 1506, was influenced by the messianic expectation of Joachim of Flora, who indicated that the conversion of distant pagan people would usher in the last days. The Portuguese opened large part of the world to Europe, worlds they were barely aware of. The religious orders, Franciscans, Dominicans, and Jesuits ushered in the greatest period of missionary activity. God, gold, and glory. These three represented the motives for expansion. God, the priority of priests. Gold, the priority of merchants. And glory, for government officials and soldiers. This resulted in the tension between religious and worldly motives. The learning of language that has no relation to any European tongue was the most immediate. Learning the languages is in order to get basic information from the natives. Missions and colonialism. Though missions were for religious purposes, they had to depend on worldly men to reach distant lands. As a result, colonialism or imperialism came to be identified with these missions. And so, Missions are embroiled in political interference. America, Columbus, educated people of the time, thought also that the world was round. Bishop Alejandro Geraldini in 1525 supported Columbus at the Spanish court about this geography. He sailed west to find a route to India, landed in the Caribbean island. Spain and Portugal. This age of exploration gave rise to the papal bull, which gave Portugal the authority to explore and claim new land. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI drew a line that divided the entire world between Spain and Portugal. 
Thus, Spain was able to claim most of the territory of the New World with Portugal getting Brazil. Indians. Indians were peaceful and gentle, though several of Columbus' men were killed by them. Columbus brought six of these Indians to Spain as slaves and became Catholics with Ferdinand and Isabella serving as godparents. The king forbade enslavement. Columbus was shunted aside by the conquistadors. Aztecs. Natives of Mexico were in fear of the brutal Aztecs, whose empire was said to be rich in gold and silver. In 1518, Hernando Cortes invaded Mexico, defeated the Aztecs, and received from Emperor Montezuma acknowledgement of Spanish rule. The Indian nations were freed from the Aztec with the firearms and horses, which the Aztecs didn't have. Due to a legend that a white god who visited Mexico and who would someday return, Cortes advanced towards Tenochtitlan in Mexico City, systematically destroyed the Aztec temples, smashed their idols. Rather than Aztecs' resistance, they thought the Spaniards possessed divine power such that when Montezuma was captured, his own people assassinated him. The Spaniards were shocked by the Aztec practice of human sacrifice at the top of the pyramid to placate the gods of war. The rights of the natives. The Spaniards tried to determine the rights of the natives in the New World with some theologians justifying conquest. Dominican Francisco de Vitoria proposed that the communities were supposed to, to be autonomous and self-governing. Despite their paganism, they are not deprived of their rights. Cajetan, the Dominican theologian, held a similar view with Pope, Pope Paul III, insisting them to have rights. Most of the laymen thought differently due to lust for wealth and power. They thought that Mexico was rich in gold. It was not until the Inca Kingdom of Peru was conquered that they had gold. They forced the Indians to work on mines or encomiendas to produce various profitable commodities. The popes forbade the slave trade early in the 15th century, but the prohibition was essentially ignored. Indians were often treated as slaves, a practice that Columbus himself favored. Ferdinand and Isabella issued decrees, decrees to mitigate the Indians' condition, but the crown itself claimed most of the profits from the colonies. One viceroy was assassinated in Peru when he tried to enforce the royal decrees. Churchmen tended to be sympathetic to the Indians. The Indians' greatest champion was Bartolomé de las Casas, who died in 1566. A Spaniard who originally came to Mexico to take possession of an encomienda. He was ordained a diocesan, diocesan priest and underwent a conversion and returned to Spain to plead the Indian cause. Later, returning to Mexico as a bishop. Besides being opposed by laymen with vested interests, Las Casas was also opposed by some Franciscans who justified the bad treatment of the Indians. After a time, he returned to Spain to plead the Indian cause passionately once again, and in a formal debate of the royal court, banquish a theological opponent who relied heavily on the justification of slavery. Las Casas went so far as to explain, if not to justify, the practice of human sacrifice on the grounds that all men knew that they were creatures and owed their existence to their creator. Thus, without the benefit of divine revelation, the Aztecs might naturally think that God demanded from them 
the sacrifice of human lives. Las Casas wrote several books recounting in sickening detail the mistreatment of the Indians, books that ironically became a principal source for the English Protestant black legend about Spanish Catholic cruelty, a legend that seldom acknowledged that it was a Spanish bishop who was the source of the story. The decimation of the natives. While many Indians were worked to death in mines and on encomiendas, and many were killed outright by cruel masters, by far the greatest damage was unintentional. The Spanish carried germs and viruses to which the Indians had no previous exposure. Hence, no resistance. During the course of the 16th century, millions died of diseases, especially smallpox, all over Latin America. Mestizos. The Spanish attitude to the Indians was complex. Unlike the English, who tried to keep the Indians at a distance, the Spanish rather freely intermingled with them even taking Indian wives and concubines, so that ultimately the predominant strain in Latin American society became the mestizos, mixed race. The imperatives of evangelization. There were debates as to whether the Indians were men like conquerors. Some clergy thought them to be so innocent that they may not have shared in the fall of Adam. Thus, no need of redemption. The savage tree of the Aztecs led some to believe they were subhuman. Church authorities decre decreed they were human and ought to be evangelized. Dominicans insisted that every Christian should convert the heathen churches, be led to the faith. Ferdinand and Isabella forbade the force to convert them, but the decree was ignored. Thus, forced conversion happened unmatched by the Protestant dislike to convert due to the predestination belief that they were not intended by God to hear the gospel. Puritans even thought they were children of the devil. The mystic theology held that God had planted in human hearts both a yearning for himself and a knowledge of right and wrong, so that following those instincts, good pagans would in time realize the falsity of their religion and embrace Christianity when it was preached to them. What was left unclear, though, was whether those who had never heard the gospel could be saved. Some Europeans thought that the natives although most were polytheists, already grasped certain basic elements of the Christian faith, such as the creation of the universe by an all-good God and the rudiments of the moral law. Some explorers thought they recognized images of the Virgin Mary in pagan temples and concluded that Mary had graciously appeared to native peoples who did not realize who she was. Obstacles. But from the beginning, conversion efforts were plagued by problems that would never be entirely resolved. A chronic shortage of priests, despite which Indians were excluded from ordination, a semi feudal social system in which the poor, mostly Indians, were often treated abominably and a popular piety that was instant, intense, but also semi-pagan. The problem of enculturation. On the other hand, anticipating the insights of modern anthropology, a few missionaries recognized that the native world was a seamless web of beliefs, rituals, social structures, and nature itself, and also so closely interwoven that an entire world would have to be changed if the natives were to be truly converted. As in Europe during the Dark Ages, the church 
thus confronted the issue of how the gospel could be incarnated in a culture very different from that of missionar from that of the missionaries themselves. Indians were not educated in the Western sense, so that issues of doctrine meant little to them. They learned the, the catechism by rote, and when the Spanish crown set up the Inquisition in the New World, it did not inquire into possible heresy among the Indians, who were deemed too simple to embrace false doctrine. doctrine. Mestizo's culture thus created its own kind of Catholicism, with the missionaries incorporating elements of the native cultures, sometimes deliberately, sometimes because the people simply continued in many of their old ways. Most perhaps continued living in two worlds, invoking both pagan and Christian powers, sometimes in the same rituals. Many transferred transferred the cults of their old gods to Catholic saints with Catholic rituals and the priests who performed them thought to have magical powers. Indians responded strongly to vivid descriptions of the rewards and punishment of the afterlife. Thus, as in the Dark Ages, conversion was less a matter of accepting new beliefs than of submitting to a new power that was recognized as superior to the old. Jesus and his saints could conquer demons, including the demons, including the old gods, and save men from every kind of evil. Because of the pagan worship of the sun, monstrances were open, often crafted with a circle of gold rays around the center, showing that Christ was the true sun, the source of all light. In a reversal of influence, this radial type of monstrance was introduced into Europe from the New World. As in late Roman times, churches were often erected on the foundations of pagan temples, with the idols buried beneath them and basins that had been used to collect the blood of sacrificial victims turned into baptismal fonts, demonstrating that Christ had triumphed over the old gods and that one good God had created everything so that even objects devoted to evil could be turned to good. Particularly significant was the fact that since Christ shed his blood for everyone, the old bloody sacrifices were not needed to appease an angry God. Guadalupe, conversions were slow in coming, but the crucial change occurred in 1531 when St. Juan Diego, who died in 1548, an Indian convert who was somewhat elderly by the standards of his society, heard singing while on his way to Mass and saw a vision of a beautiful lady who addressed him affectionately, affectionately in his native tongue. She identified herself as the mother of God and told Juan Diego that she wanted a church built on the site of her appearance, establishing a link between the new world and the old by identifying herself with Guadalupe, a Marian shrine in Spain. At first, the bishop was skeptical, but he was convinced when at the lady's bidding, Juan Diego brought roses blooming in the cold of winter. As the roses tumbled out of his cloak, an image of the lady appeared on the cloth. Dark complexioned and wearing a kind of belt used by pregnant Indian women. A church was then built to enthrone the image, which now rests in a modern structure on the same site. This Marian apparition seemed to affirm dramatically the suitability of Indian culture to receive the Christian message and the inherent worth and dignity of the Indian people themselves. This dramatic expression of the Catholic faith soon brought 9 million native converts into the church. 
the greatest mass conversion in history and Our Lady of Guadalupe became the focal point, point of Mexican Catholicism and eventually the patroness of the Americas. Effects of conversion. The church in Latin America continued to grow with almost all its inhabitants becoming at least nominal Catholics. And for many, the faith went very deep. Much from the Church of Europe was replicated in the New World, including a system of education, eventually including 17 universities throughout Latin America, the oldest at Lima and Mexico City, predating Harvard by more than a century. A number of great Baroque churches were built all over Latin America and the visual arts flourish. A cloistered Hieronymite nun from this period, Juana de la Cruz, who died in 1695, is considered a major poet of the Spanish language. Latin America also produced saints, including the Spaniard Toribius of Lima, who died in 1606, a reforming archbishop who tried to protect the Indians, Rose of Lima, who died in 1617, a native Peruvian who lived the mystical life in emulation of Catherine of Siena, Martin de Pones, who died in 1639, born at Lima of a Spanish father and a black mother, who, as a Domin Dominican lay brother, cared for the poor and destitute. And Peter Clav Claver, who died in 1654, a Spanish Jesuit who devoted his life to the slaves of the Caribbean. Rose was cano canonized in 1671, the first saint of the Americas. But although few were ordained, Indians were considered unsuited to the priesthood. Men of pure Spanish blood were prepared with mestizos, Indians, mulatos, those of mixed black and white lineage, and blacks in descending order of preference. The Paraguay Reducciones. In many ways, the most remarkable chapter in the history of the Latin American missions, and one of the most remarkable anywhere at any time, were the reducciones established by the Jesuits in Paraguay in the 17th century. By 1700, these communities embraced 100,000 Indians, perhaps the most successful social experiment ever attempted. The missions took their name from the attempt, later tried in California, to reduce the Indians, that is, to settle them in compact, highly organized communities, since nomadic peoples or those living in scattered villages often lost the faith. Each reduction was a large square surrounded on three sides by the homes of the Indians and on the fourth side by a church, workshops, and other communal structures. Each reduction was entirely self-sustaining with the Indians taught agriculture, herding, and basic crops. White men, especially merchants, were barred, and the Indians were even permitted by the Spanish crown to form armies for their own protection. The reductionists were undone in the 1750s in the most brutal manner possible. As part of Pombal's fanatical attack on the church, after he managed to obtain Paraguay from Spain, perhaps precisely in order to suppress the reductionists, a manifestation of the spirit of Josephinism and Gallicanism. The Jesuits were ordered to announce to the Indians that they, they must leave the, reduction, the reductionists with no provision of any kind. And when the missionaries protested, the Portuguese government sent a cooperative Jesuit to, end, to threaten them with an excommunication. The local bishop was an appointee of the crown, and the timid Jesuit leadership in Rome also ordered the Paraguay Jesuits to obey. The Indians, however, 
kept up an armed rebellion for five years until they were finally crushed and the reductionists obliterated. Latin American independence. The conquest of Spain and Portugal by Napoleon a generation later allowed a series of rebellions to erupt in Latin America, as a result of which most of the colonies gained their independence within a few years. Clergy were on both sides of the struggle for independence. Some believe that their oath of fidelity to the Spanish monarch was morally binding, while others propagated radical enlightenment ideas. Two Mexican priests, namely Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla, who died in 1811, and Jose Maria Morales, who died in 1815, helped to raise rebel troops, commanded them in battle, and were ev eventually captured and shot. The Holy See vacillated, supporting the restoration of Spain's colonies after the defeat of Napoleon, but a few years later, appointing bishops without reference to the Spanish king, which in effect recognized Latin American independence. The future Pius IX was the first pope to visit the New World as a member of a papal delegation in 1823. Endemic Troubles After independence, the history of Latin American Catholicism was to a great extent the story of complex and troubled relationships between the church, the governments in power, and various forces for political and economic change. Economic change. Latin American Catholics had a deep piety and were loyal to the church. But in addition to the chronic shortage of priests, both clerical and lay concubinage was common. Both Hidalgo, E. Castilla, and Morales fathered children, especially in rural villages. Religion was often experienced primarily as adherence through traditional rituals some of them dubiously Christian, rather than as a force for moral and spiritual transformation. Anti-clericalism. At first, some of the newly uh, independent states confirmed the special status of the church. But as with the European liberalism, the spirit of independence often came to be directed against the church as part of the oppressive old regime. Anti-clerical Freemasonry was a powerful influence among liberal leaders, and the church was stripped of, stripped of her extensive lands while her influence over education was curtailed. Ecuador briefly was an unusual exception under Garcia Moreno, who died in 1875, who declared it to be an officially Catholic country dedicated to the Sacred Heart, where both the Masonic Order and all condemned books were banned, an experiment that came to an end when Moreno was assassinated. India the Portuguese. Pope Alexander VI's division of the world applied to the Far East as well as to the New World and thereby gave the Portu Portuguese a claim to India. As Columbus was discovering the West while searching for the East, Portuguese were traveling to the East around the southern tip of Africa. The Portuguese were quick to establish trading posts on the southern coast of the Indian subcontinent, primarily in order to exploit the vastly profitable spice trade. An ancient culture. The Europeans' attitude toward, toward Asia was entirely different from their attitude toward America. Since Asia was not wholly unfamiliar territory and its various uh, kingdoms were very ancient, rich and sophisticated, therefore not to be dismissed as almost subhuman.
strategically, strategically, the Europeans could not simply conquer, but had to bargain with local princes for concessions. St. Thomas Christians. The Europeans also found that Christianity was not entirely strange to Asia. The St. Thomas Christians were centered around the island city of Goa, which the Portuguese conquered and turned into a trading center. Goa was soon made a diocese, and from that base, Franciscan missionaries were able to extend their activities into neighboring territories. Xavier Missionary activity of all kinds received a new impetus and new directions from the arrival in India in 1541 of St. Francis Xavier, who died in 1552. Xavier had been one of Ignatius Loyola's earliest companions, and Ignatius, who thirsted for the conversion of the world, sent him to the East only a year after the Society of Jesus was officially approved. Xavier's mission was the first application of the new Jesuit system of formation and organization. Unlike the Franciscans and missionaries of other orders, he went to his new assignment entirely alone, knowing that he would probably never return. Homesick for his brethren, he cut their signatures out of the letters he received and kept them in a locket. A holy man, Saber's ascetism fit well with the Indian image of the holy man. He wore sandals and a dirty, tattered cassock, slept on the beach when necessary, observed stringent fast, and tried to avoid the company of women. Begging, he found, far from being a cause of shame, was often respected as the sign of a holy man, who had renounced all worldly goods. He was outspoken in his denunciation of the Europeans in India, not excluding some missionaries, men who lived scandalous lives, mistreated the natives, and were themselves the greatest obstacles to conversions. The Devil's Work For Savior, the realities were quite simple. Innumerable souls, souls were being lost because of a false religion that was probably of the devil. Just as human sacrifice pro proved to, to the Spanish that the Aztec religion was evil, so Suti in India, the custom by which a widow threw himself on her husband's funeral pyre, proved the evil of the Hinduism. So tea was an obligation from which Christian converts were freed, and it was suppressed even among the Hindus in the lands the Europeans controlled. As in Mexico, some explorers found that they thought were images of the Virgin Mary in native temples, but Savior demanded that all idols be destroyed, and he pressed men into giving up their concubines. Mass conversions. In journeys outside the security of Goa itself, Savior quickly made large numbers of converts, whom he baptized as soon as possible on the basis of minimal catechetics. He administ administered so many baptisms at one time that he sometimes had to have his arms supported as he poured the water. His best known relic, kept at Goa is his right forearm. He spent many hours hearing confessions and urged Ignatius to send men who were not necessarily learned but who were physically strong. Caste. Indian society was divided into caste, social groups determined by birth and rigidly de redefined, from which there could be no escape except they believed through reincarnation. The highest case were the Brahmins, men who were supposed to be both learned and deeply spiritual, and who, if they did not actually rule Indian society, at least set its tone. 
Uh, the other extreme was the case of those who were literally untouchable. People whose conduct in a previous life had supposedly merited their being reborn as hewers of wood and drawers of water. Savior's rapid evangelization of India brought with it the question of whether the faith could be inculturated in the caste system. Europeans also took for granted that mankind was arranged in a social hierarchy and that those in the lower orders had to show difference to those above. But Christianity taught that all so social groups were equal in the sight of God. While in India, the case were rigid manifestations of the inflexible divine will. Most of Savior's converts seem to have been from the untouchables, which meant that the church might attract large numbers of, numbers of people but could never hope to convert Indian society as a whole. By converting to Christianity, untouchables overcame their shameful and exploited status. But few Brahmins became Christians, if only because to do so would be to lose all social status by associating with untouchables. Let's go to Indonesia. Praying at the tomb of St. Thomas, Savior felt inspired to go to the Molucca Islands. This is modern Indonesia where the Portuguese had an outpost and there were already a few Christians. He spent two years there with more limited success than in India. Feeling strongly the devil's presence, he performed a number of exorcisms after spending the night in prayer. Islam was strong presence in Moluccas and Savior found what other Christians had discovered before him. Muslims were especially resistant to conversion, due perhaps to their strict monotheism, which caused them immediately to, de to revuff all talk of Trinitarian God. The fact that the Quran contained its own account of Jesus and the fact that apostasy from Islam was punishable by death. Rise Christians. Returning to India as the superior of the Jesuit mission, he summarily dismissed from the society a Jesuit who had failed to go on a dangerous assignment. Savior found that some converts continued to worship idols secretly, and some were even drawn back completely into paganism. Other missionaries questioned whether Savior's converts had been properly instructed and raised the issue of what would later be called Rice Christians. Rice Christians are those who accepted baptism because of the material benefits it offered. The phenomenon posed, posed a serious dilemma for missionaries in that they had obligations in charity to help poor pagans, but such charity might seem like enticement. Inculturation. St. Paul's College heavily supported, like other missionary projects in Egypt, by the King of Portugal, was, at, was set up at Goa to train native priests, teaching them Latin so that they could study theology and celebrate the liturgy. Savior, however, wanted less emphasis on philosophy and theology and more on practical experience. In one of his few conscious efforts at inculturation, he urged that the penitential season of Lent be transferred to, su to the summer since otherwise there would be no fish available. Problems. Despite the bad example of some Europeans, the missions continued to attract a large number of converts, mainly from the lower caste, and native Indians entered the Jesuit order in such numbers that the Indian province of the society, encompassing all of East Asia, was soon larger than all the others combined. But in the 1570s, an official Jesuit visitor, the Italian Alessandro Valignano, who died in 1606, arrived 
for an inspection and found conditions deplorable. Poverty, injustice, lawlessness, and waning zeal on the part of the missionaries. Some Indian Jesuit, uh, Jesuits' houses had slaves since certain kinds of labor were thought to be degrading for free men, although the slaves were supposed to be eventually freed. The nobili. More than half a century after Savior's death, the Italian Jesuit Roberto de Nubili, who died in 1656, also working in India, raised ideas about inculturation that differed radically from Savior's own. De Nubili feared that so long as most converts, converts came from the lower case, Catholicism would never be fully accepted in India and that in order to convert the whole society, it was necessary to convert the Brahmins. Natural Theology Denobili knew more about Hinduism than any of his contemporaries because he made the arduous effort to learn the Sanskrit and Tamil languages in which the Hindu sacred books were written. Like all Jesuits of his era, he was a Thomist, and the Thomistic emphasis on natural theology, the, theolo, theology, the truths knowable by the mind even before it receives divine revelation, underlay his efforts. Then Obili attempted to bring his audience as far as possible towards Christianity by reasoning in the Thomistic manner from visible effects to their causes, the Creator, proving the attributes necessary to such a Creator, all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal, and establishing that ultimately the truths of God, because they are infinite and are beyond human understanding and requires divine revelation. But there were serious differences between Catholics and Hindus that could not be compromised. Monotheism. Christ as the only Son of God and Savior. The practice of Sati and beliefs in reincarnation. The nobili argued that those unacceptable beliefs were the irrational degeneration of truths that had once been known but had been lost. The term Veda referring to Hindu sacred texts, derived, he thought, from this original revelation given to the Indians by God. Indian laws, of which the Brahmins were in a sense the custodians and interpreters, were often uh, wise and just, based on the knowledge of good and evil that God had implanted in the human heart. Thus, no radical change in the laws was necessary. The nobilis approach. Tacity rejecting Savior's methods, the nobili urged the missionaries to dispel pagan darkness gradually and not to make frontal assaults on Indian beliefs and practices. Certain things such as habits of dress and diet seem cultural only, and he repeatedly cited the ways in which the early Christians had adopted the gospel to Greco-Roman culture. Most important was the missionaries' acceptance of the caste system, particularly their respect for the Brahmins. The Nibili urged that the missionaries themselves live as Brahmins, adopting the customs and attitudes appropriate for their learning of their, their high birth. To be despised as a follower of Christ was one thing, he argued, but to be despised as a person of low social class was another. Implicitly, he seemed to consign the apostolate of the untouchables to the lower class Franciscans. The core of the nobilis argument was that the Brahmins were not a religious group at all, but merely a highly respected class of learned men so that they could be baptized yet retain all the habits of their class. 
in great, in great detail, he analyzed their dress, diet, and other things in order to demonstrate that this had social significance only. Not religious, in, uh, not religious. In addition, he argued their significance would change if the Brahmins converted. Condemnation. Denobili received the endorsement of some of the Catholic hierarchy in India and of Robert Bellarmine, but his work was condemned by Pope Urban VIII in a decision that was soon reversed. Overall, Denobili seems to have made few intellectual converts, and he complained that often those whom he debated seemed merely confused. He was a pioneer in the theology of enculturation, but he seems to have underestimated the difficulty of separating the religious and social threads of an ancient and tightly woven culture. Medi Indian Mughals. The Christian presence in India was almost entirely confined to the South. Much of uh, Northern India was ruled by the Mughals several of whose khans were only nominally Muslim and not only allowed Jesuits into their territories, but permitted them to challenge Muslim and Hindu sages in public debates. Some even privately expressed interest in the Catholic faith. But the last of this, Shah Jahan, who died in 1666, famous as the builder of the Taj, Taj Mahal, finally committed, committed himself to Islam and outlawed Christianity. Japan. Savior was tantalized by stories told by travelers from distant Japan that the Japanese were a curious people who yearned to know the truth even had their own mo monasteries. In 1549, Savior was tantalized by stories told by travelers from distant Japan that the Japanese were curious people who yearned to know the truth and even had their own monasteries. In 1549, he achieved his dream of going there, arriving on a merchant ship and for the first time leaving the security of a transplanted European settlement, venturing with little support into largely unknown territory. The Daimyos. Despite many efforts, Savior was unable to obtain an audience with the almost mythical emperor, whose power, perhaps unknown to Savior, was actually quite weak and who was dominated by officials called shoguns. But some Daimyos or feudal lords were friendly to the stranger in part because they wanted to open trade relations with the Spanish and Portuguese. Savior discovered that in Japan, begging was shameful and his shabby and humble appearance, which had made him credible to the Indians, had the opposite effect on the Japanese, who thought there could be little wisdom in someone who was so obviously a failure. Following the Ignatian principle of detachment, making use of worldly things without desiring them, he obtained good clothes from a European ship and found that he was now listened to more respectfully. From European merchants, Savior also obtained such things as clocks, eyeglasses, telescopes, and muskets, gifts that impressed the daimyos and helped gain him a reputation for wisdom. Feudal politics. From the beginning, the bonzes or Buddhist monks were Savior's chief enemy. These spiritual leaders of Japanese society quite correctly saw him as a formid formidable rival and intrigued against him at the courts of the daimyos, without whose at least passive tolerance the missionaries could make no headway. Despite his normal ascetism, Savior ate meat and fish as a sign that it was permitted since the bonzes abstained. 
Savior made her heroic made heroic journeys on foot to visit as much of the island as he could. At first, conversions were very few. Although in time, there were opportunities for mass baptisms of the simplest people, so long as they abandoned their idols. As in India, he ordered the destruction of pagan temples wherever the daimyos permitted. There, were, there was often political rivalry, rivalry between daimyos and local Buddhist monasteries, which were deeply involved in the feudal politics of Japan, so that the daimyos, especially those who valued trade with the Europeans, did not automatically side with the monks. Rheological debates. Savior encountered Buddhism and to a lesser extent Shintoism, an ancient Japanese religion centered around the veneration of ancestors without having a name for them. Both religions were complex and in their highest expressions, very sophisticated. He sometimes engaged in formal debates with the monses and whereas in India, he had valued missionaries' physical stamina over their intellectual achievements. He now urged his superiors in Rome to send learned men. He confirmed that some Japanese were indeed curious, requiring answers to difficult questions. How was the universe created? Was there a difference between men and animals? Was there personal immortality? When asked why God had waited so long to send the gospel to Japan, thereby condemning er earlier generations to hell, Savior replied evasively, pointing out that the pagans had at least a rudimentary knowledge of the moral law, but not stating explicitly whether their ancestors were damned. Catechetic. He developed a simple catechism translated into Japanese and organized around the story of salvation, beginning with Adam and Eve and culminating with Christ. In accord with Ignatian principles, Savior sought to use whatever in Japanese culture might help to promote the gospel, making use of some pagan terms such as those for angels and demons. With virtual with, with virtually no knowledge of the Japanese language, Savior at first relied on an Indian interpreter who, interpreter who had previously visited Japan. But when some of his hearers either laughed or walked away in confusion, Savior discovered that the word the interpreter was, was mistakenly using for God actually mean, meant the big lie. This raised the question to what extent Catholic doctrine formulated in Hebrew and Greek terms could be transplanted to other cultures. To avoid confusion, Savior henceforth simply used the Latin word Deus and stopped using the Buddhist term for the highest power, lest it merely confirm the pagans in what they already believed. As in the early centuries of the church, the crucifix, the proudest symbol of Christianity, was a stumbling block to the Japanese, who, encouraged by the bonzes, saw it as merely a shameful punishment imposed on criminals. Sexual Morality Savior claimed that Japanese parents were naive in sending their sons to be educated by the bonzes, who had great prestige but were pedophiles. In debate, the bonzes denied that there was any moral fault involved, and Savior replied that the distinction between male and female was fundamental to creation. Developments in the Japanese missions. India served as the training ground for Jesuits sent to Japan, where there were about 30,000 Catholics in 1570 and 150,000 a decade later. The interest of the missionaries and the European merchants coincided 
as the possibility of trade was held out to the various daimyos in order to obtain permission to proselytize. The daimyo Oda Nobunaga of Osaka, who died in 1582, was particularly friendly, actually persecuting Buddhists and saying that he would convert to Catholicism if he were allowed to keep his many mistresses. Native Japanese were at first admitted to the Society of Jesus, but the policy was soon reversed as the superior of the Japanese mission the Portuguese Francisco Cabral, who died in 1609, came to regard the natives as treacherous, perhaps due mainly to the fact that the missions were, were at the mercy of shifting political winds. To Cabral, the Japanese were an inferior people who would have to remain semi-permanently under European spiritual tutelage and would tutelage and would have to adopt European ways in order to live as Catholics. To Cabral, the Japanese were an inferior people who would have to remain semi-permanently under European semi-tutelage and would have to adopt European ways in order to live as Catholics. The official visitor Balignano arrived in 1579 and he and Cabral soon came to embody opposing philosophies of mission. Based on his reports to Rome, Balignano's philosophy was eventually accepted and he became perhaps the first modern man to formulate clearly the policy that would at least in principle govern all subsequent Catholic missionary activity that native cultures were to be respected in so far as they did not impede the faith. Pope Gregory the Great had initiate, initiated a similar principle, which went, which went as far back as St. Paul's treatment of Gentile converts. Inculturation. Balignano wrote a kind of guide to inculturation following the Ignatian exercise of weighing the factors both in favor and against continuing the Japanese mission. The negatives, which were admittedly serious, were the facts that conversions were slow and dependent on unpredictable political and economic factors, and that converts were often tepid and easily slide back into paganism slid back into paganism. On the other side were the facts that the mission was the only access the people of Japan had to the gospel and that dubious converts of one generation might produce fervent souls in the next. Pelignano was highly conscious that resources, both in men and in money, were being stretched thin. But he urged that the missionaries continue to seek converts instead of concentrating on the care of the flock they already had. Native vocations were slow in coming, partly because of the difficulty learning Latin. As in India, most of the Jesuit vocations were from the higher classes. Balignano mitigated the practice of having converts destroy pagan temples, and he allowed the observance of traditional Japanese feasts, provided they were stripped of their religious rituals. Some converts had already proved their faith by enduring persecution, while those who lapsed did so under pressure from their lords and open because they rarely saw a priest and those they did see did not know the Japanese language. As the apostles had done, it was sufficient for the time being to get the pagans merely to abstain from idols and from, and from fornication, Balignano thought. Respect for the Japanese he saw that the mission was imped, impeded by the perceived arrogance of some Europeans. Cambral inflicted blows and harsh words on the converts and insisted that European missionaries learn Japanese. 
Contrary to Cabral, he expressed admiration for the natives' stoical endurance of hardship and their courtesy, although admitting they could also be inscrutable and cruel. Balignano had some contempt for Indians and blacks, but he called the Japanese white people. Perhaps he predicted somewhat daringly there might in time even be a Japanese, Japanese bishop. Liturgy. The Japanese love show and ceremony. Balignano found so that as soon as possible it was desirable to build substantial churches. Not, however, in the Japanese style, because that would constitute emulation of the pagans. Although Ignatius had enjoined his man to celebrate the litur liturgy simply, Balignano thought that in Japan it should be celebrated with as much solemnity as possible. Japanese Customs On the practical level, Jesuit seminarians were to be allowed their na native diet. They, they found some European eating habits disgusting and their accustomed posture, half crouching, half sitting when eating or studying. Table utensils were not to be used since they were not the Japanese custom and contrary to Savior's practice, meat was not to be eaten where it offended the Japanese. Jesuits could wear sandals and their cassocks might resemble kimonos. Balignano compiled a kind of etiquette book for Jesuits who might miss the sub subtleties of Japanese culture. A man of social standing should not carry his own umbrella, should not travel alone, and might ride a horse or walk but could not ride a lowly kind of animal like a donkey. Complex procedures govern hospitality and relations with persons of social of various of various social classes, and appropriate gifts were to be given. Men could wear their hats in church since, in contrast to European custom, not to do so was considered a sign of disrespect. Pagan morality. Respecting customs was one thing, but differences in morality were more problematic. Childhood marriages were common in Japan, and therefore, divorces were as well. And Balignano wondered if such marriages were valid in the eyes of the church. Also problematic was the practice of suicide, which was not only permissible in Japanese culture, but virtually obligatory in order to escape dishonor. Balignano wondered how to reconcile this pervasive concept of honor with Christian humility. Slavery was to be tolerated, but, but Jesuits should make efforts to help runaways. Canon law forbade ordaining a man who had committed a homicide, but impulsive killings were common among the Japanese, whom Balignano said resorted to the sword more quickly than to harsh words or blows or blows. He thus recommended that the rule should be invoiced only against those who committed the deed after conversion. Franciscans. At first, the Pope had given the Japanese mission entirely to the Jesuits, but Franciscans began arriving in increasing numbers, and the mission was weakened by differences between the two orders that erupted into quarrels. Jesuits were said to eat better food and to wear better clothes than the Franciscans, something that was not a matter of personal preference, but a pragmatic judgment as to what the Japanese expected. The Franciscans continued to beg, which in Japan led to loss of social status. Jesuits nursed the sick, but touching lepers and the very poor was hateful to many of the very cleanly Japanese, so that the care of such people was mostly felt was mostly left to the Franciscans, an ironic application of an Ignatian principle, in that most Jesuits probably felt an obligation to help the poor, 
but were required to make a pragmatic judgment as to whether that would aid their mission. The Silk Trade The Far East missions were heavily subsidized by the Spanish and Portuguese governments, and the visionaries sometimes chafed under the restriction that could impose. In order to liberate themselves, at least in part, the Jesuits became directly involved in the lucrative silk trade that flourished all over the East, serving as middlemen for international transactions. Although the Pope at one point ordered the Jesuits to, to, see, to cease their involvement in the trade, it continued drawing the Jesuits into political intrigues and making them vulnerable to the charge of being agents of foreign governments. Palignano thought this involvement was imprudent just as he was suspicious of the missionaries' close dependence on friendly daimyos. Competition. After 1600, English and Netherlandish merchants also began to visit Japanese ports. And some tried to undermine the Jesuits in order to undermine the Spanish and Portuguese traders. The situation varied greatly from one province to another, but in all cases, the Jesuits were de dependent on the unpredictable attitudes of the daimyos. Persecution the daimyo Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who died, in, who died in 1598, who succeeded Nobunaga, almost immediately turned against the Christians. The largest concentration was in the port city of Nagasaki, and in 1597, in a preview of things soon to come, he ordered the crucifixion of 26 Christians, including six Franciscans accused of being foreign spies. After Hideyoshi's death, the persecution temporarily, temporarily abated. However, in 1614, the shogun Tokugawa Iyasu, who died in 1616, ordered the expulsion of all the missionaries. Many left, although some continued to minister in secret. The persecution continued after Iesu's death and spread throughout Japan. An organized propaganda war accused the Christians of undermining the imperial state and the authority of the Damios. Their monotheism was said to be insulting to the many gods. Eventually, there were 5,000 Catholic martyrs, of whom only 70 were Europeans. They were subjected to inhuman tortures, the worst of which was to be hung upside down over pits of exc excrement, slowly dying of asphyxiation. Many apostatized, including one Japanese Jesuit who was uh, rumored to have himself become a persecutor, although his full story is unknown. Unfortunately, martyrdom did not seem to have the same effect in Japan as elsewhere. Christianity was founded on the idea of the holiness of martyrdom, but Japanese culture found martyrdom almost incomprehensible. Christians were supposed to follow the law of God, which might conflict with that of the state, and hence regarded martyrdom as the seal of their faith. Japanese culture, however, recognized no transcendent moral law. The civil law embodied the highest moral principles, including obedience, and those who were put to death were seen as mere criminals. Foreigners expelled. The Tokugawa dynasty, founded by Iyasu, ordered the expulsion of all foreigners from the empire, including Spanish and Portuguese merchants. A trade pact was then made with the Protestant Netherlanders, who were not allowed on the mainland of Japan and could neither proselytize nor practice their religion. Even Bibles were banned. 
in an episode almost unparalleled in history, Japan made the radical decision to obliterate all the foreign influences it had absorbed over the previous 50 years and to return to its ancestral ways. The door was shut to all foreigners and would remain so for over two centuries. China, the lure. After three years in Japan, Xavier, now the superior of all the Jesuit missions in the East, returned to Goa, not with the intention of staying, but in the hope of being able to venture into the vast, mysterious empire of China, possibly to find the court of the legendary Prester John. Except for the island of Macau, the Chinese empire had long been so rigidly close to outsiders that shipwrecked Portuguese sailors had been imprisoned and tortured after taking refuge there. Although Xavier managed to obtain the official title of papal nuncio to China, the Portuguese government at Goa would not permit him to travel there. Characteristically, he took matters into his own hands, arranging in 1552 for a ship to put him ashore on an island off the Chinese coast, from whence a smuggler would take him to the mainland. While waiting for the smuggler, this greatest missionary in the history of Christianity after St. Paul, took sick and died alone. Missionaries Admitted Missionaries were not allowed into China until a generation after Savior's death, once again mainly because of the lure of trade with the West. After the suppression of Christianity in Japan, many young people, Jesuits in Europe, many young Jesuits in Europe, asked to be assigned to China, partly in the hope of martyrdom. Those who were sent were highly trained in theology, philosophy, and the sciences and undertook a new kind of mission strategy, the kind that De Nobili would advocate later, approaching the Chinese at the highest intellectual level, converting the whole culture by first converting its head. The Italian Michel Ruggieri, who died in 1607, who arrived around 1580, made ser serious efforts to learn the Chinese language and compiled a catechism but found that the Chinese balk at the idea that God could have become man and especially at the idea that he had died on the cross. Ricci. The key figure in the Chinese apostolate was the Italian Matteo Ricci, who died in 1610, who had been a novice in Italy under Balignano and who arrived in China in 1583. He eventually settled in the imperial city of Beijing, although as in Japan, he never gained access to the semi-mythical emperor. Like Savior, Ricci exemplified Ignatius' realization that a Jesuit might have to live for many years away from any community. community. Anti-Buddhism. Ricci wished to be seen by the Chinese as a wise man, and like his predecessors in Japan, brought them clocks, mops, and other intriguing Western inventions. At first, he wore the robes of a Buddhist monk, but as he came to understand the cultural scene, he changed into the robes of a Confucian scholar and became a severe critic of Buddhism. Then, Nobili was also very anti-Buddhist, accepting the Hindu, the Hindu charge that Buddhists were atheists. Ricci realized that for the most part, Buddhism was not respected by the class called the Mandarins, a word actually coined by the Portuguese. Educated men who held important offices and who set the direction of Chinese culture who saw it as a popular religion filled with superstition. Ricci seems not to have understood that some Buddhist ideas 
had been adopted in co into Confucianism, and in particular, he failed to grasp the Buddhist concept of nothingness, the obliteration of all particular identities in one great unity. Confucianism. Most Mandarins were Confucians, followers of the semi-legendary sage who had been more a philosopher than a theologian and whose emphasis on respect for one's ancestors, tradition, law, social and political order, self-discipline, and personal integrity suited the needs of the great empire that the Mandarins helped to govern. Ricci probably attributed to Confucianism a greater coherence than it actually possessed, seeing it as a system remarkably, remarkably congruent with Christianity and with the Greco-Roman Stoicism that had strongly influenced the Christian tradition. He therefore set out to convince the Mandarins that they need not abandon the age-old wisdom of Confucius but instead could defend that wisdom by embracing the wisdom of Christianity. Christianity could supply what Confucianism lacked, a comprehensive and coherent account of the entire universe, its origins, and ultimate goal. Pure Confucianism, Ricci asserted, was a survivor from the remote ancient time, which the Chinese regarded as a golden age the equivalent of paradise in the Jewish and Christian account. In time, however, corruption set in Chinese ambassadors who heard of the wisdom of Christianity, traveled west to find it, but ended their journey in India. Ricci speculated where they adopted Hindu wisdom by mistake. Buddhism, an, off an offshoot of Hinduism, contained numerous false myths and rituals and was the enemy of true wisdom. Apologetics. Ricci published a comprehensive summary of his ideas just a few years before his death in the form of a dialogue between a Christian and a Confucian in which the Christian answered all the pagans' questions and converted him. Ricci set out to bring Confucianism and Christianity as close together as possible, but he fo followed the Ignatian principle of tailoring the message to the capacity of the hearers, probably judging that cert certain hard sayings would require years of preparation. Ricci began with the creation of the universe, the necessity that one Lord should rule over everything and the necessity that such a being must be a person, an understanding beyond such vague Chinese phrases as the ultimate being. In particular, he explained the true meaning of the Confucian phrase, the Lord of Heaven, which he said the Confucians had conceived because of the natural knowledge of himself that God placed in all people but which needed to be clarified and deepened by the revealed wisdom of Christianity. Later, Jesuits, fearful that this Confucian term would merely encourage the Chinese to continue worshipping their ancestral deities, debate, debated over the proper word without fully resolving it. Reputing the idea of reincarnation, Ricci spent considerable effort proving the immortality of the soul and the reality of heaven and hell, without which goodness would not be rewarded and evil punished, and which were therefore strong factors in human motivation. Confucians thought that human nature was essentially good and needed merely to be cultivated whereas Ricci argued that the will could be perverted and needed guidance from on high. Only toward the end of his treatise did Ricci treat of Christianity, and specifically of Catholicism, in the concrete. He did not acknowledge the religious divisions of the West 
and made only brief reference to the papal office. But he expounded at length on the meaning and utility of celibacy, which he found to be a stumbling block to the Chinese. Nor did he speak of other difficult Catholic doctrines, such as the real presence. The idea of the Mass as a sacrifice would have seemed almost subversive to the Chinese because the emperor alone was qualified to offer sacrifice. Almost reaches only concession to Catholic practice was the injunction that to enter the kingdom of the Lord of Heaven, it was necessary to undergo cleansing with water, which wipe away all past wrongs. Initially, he referred to Jesus only to explain the meaning of the title Jesuit. But toward the end of the treatise, he revealed that at one point in history, the world had fallen into such evil ways that out of compassion, the Lord of Heaven had chosen a chaste woman to bear a son who taught the people before returning to heaven. In keeping with the character of Christianity as a historical religion, Ricci dated the incarnation quite precisely from the reign of a particular Chinese emperor. Perhaps not wishing to perplex his readers with the doctrine of the Trinity, Ricci did not distinguish father and son but explained that Jesus was himself the Lord of Heaven, his divinity proven especially by his many miracles and by the fact that he was venerated as a holy man. Because of the earlier rejection of Rogeri's catechism by the Chinese, Ricci never recounted the narrative of the Passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, although at that time of his own death, he was in the process of translating the Bible into Chinese. Converts Ricci was naturally opposed by Buddhist scholars and also by some Confucians who thought that he was distorting the pure teaching. He did not aim at mass conversions and made only a few converts among the mandarins, converts to whom Presumably, he imparted the fullness of Catholic teaching, and some of whom proved to be able and influential apologists for the Catholic faith. Paul Su Guangqi, who died in 1623, and Michael Zhang Tingyan, who died in 1627, were important imperial bureaucrats who were attracted to Christianity, Christianity partly because of the antidotes such as the daily examination of conscience it provided to the corruption of the imp it provided to the corruption of the imperial court no jesuit achieved the dream of being allowed to evangelize the emperor in part because a phalanx of eunuchs guarded access however even a few eunuchs were converted as were some ladies of the court Ricci honored. Although Ricci was sometimes harassed and threatened by hostile mobs, he was honored by his, at his death by being allowed to be buried in the imperial city of Beijing, a privilege usually denied to foreigners. A few years after his death, an archaeological discovery showed that Christianity, probably Nestorian, had existed in China many centuries before, something that gave the faith renewed prestige. Groth In 1600, there were other Jesuits in China and about 2,500 converts. As in Japan, the emperor was weak, a fact perhaps not apparent to the missionaries, so that Toleration of Christians depended primarily on local authorities, some of whom initiated persecutions from time to time. After Ricci's death, the Jesuits expanded their uh, theft activities beyond elite circles, and by the end of the 17th century, there were 200,000 Christians in China, almost a hundred times the number at the beginning.
Franciscans and Dominicans began coming to China in the generation of, uh, after Rich's death, as did the Parish Foreign Mission Society, which had been founded under the ages of the Company of the Blessed Sacrament. As happened in India and Japan, a division once again developed between two different approaches to mission activity. Franciscan methods. In Rich's plan, the stakes were very high in that the conversion of the mandarins would have led to the conversion of the entire Chinese empire. But the plan essentially failed. The Franciscan had much greater success than the Jesuits which, with direct appeals to the common people using a strategy similar to that used to convert the barbarians of the Dark Ages. The promise of release from the power of demons and the prospect of eternal life com combined with concrete things like statues, rosaries, and public pr processions manifesting divine power. Some of the missionaries wa were regarded as miracle workers. Native vocations. While the early Jesuits learned the language of the Mandarins, other missionaries had to cope with innumerable local dialects. Despite the best efforts, verbal communication between priests and people was open poor. A request to the Holy See to allow the liturgy to be translated into Chinese was never answered, but the Latin language was a major barrier to a native priesthood, and the Holy See ruled the Chinese priest could recite the liturgy without understanding the specific words, so long as they understood their general meaning. With few natives being ordained, expansion of the church into rural areas, open left converts with inadequate pastoral guidance. Trained catechists often serve as the leaders of local communities with occasional visits by the priests to administer the sacraments. The canonical category of consecrated virgin was the means by which women shared in this lay leadership, performing works of charity, instructing the faithful, and administering baptism in those frequent situations where new newborn infants were in imminent danger of death. It was a delicate situation in that suspicious pagans sometimes claim that baptism actually killed babies. Candida Zhu, who died in 1680, was a Catholic who converted her pagan husband, and after his death, she followed the ancient calling of the Holy Widow who devoted her life to works of charity and support of the church. Another ancient pattern that reappeared was that of young women rejecting the husbands chosen for them by their families in order to live a life of religious dedication. Since the authority of the family was very strong in China, this was sometimes a major point of conflict with the culture. In 1659, the Holy See established three vicariates in China, each governed by a European bishop, but with the intention that they develop a native clergy, Gregory Luo Wenzhou, who died in 1691, a Franciscan, was the first native Chinese priest and bishop, although his promotion was opposed by some European missionaries. Shall. Some Jesuits remained active among the Mandarins and even got access to the imperial court. In particular, the German Adam Schall, who died in 1666, one of the wise men from the West, gain enormous prestige by accurately predicting an eclipse. He was put in charge of the Imperial Astronomical Office, which was important because the stability of the emperor's reign was thought to depend on a perfect 
harmony between the earth and the cosmos. Shal made a number of converts. Other Jesuits also serve as court astronomers, and the German Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, who died in 1680, although he did not visit China, compiled the first Chinese dictionary and a Coptic dictionary as well. When the Manchu dynasty conquered China in 1644, Shal and other Jesuits were for a time imprisoned. Shal managed to establish good relations with the new rulers who reprieved him after he had been sentenced to death on false charges of being a spy and restored him to his position as director of imperial astronomy. He was denounced even by some of his fellow Jesuits for being too involved with the new regime. Throughout the later 17th century, the church in China was divided by what came to be called the Chinese Rites Controversy, a disagreement that brought into high relief the ambiguities of inculturation. The principal dispute centered on whether Catholics might participate in certain traditional rituals, some having to do with their own ancestors others with the figure of Confucius. The Jesuits tolerated the rituals on the grounds that they were merely a way of honoring people who deserve honor, while the Franciscans and Dominicans insisted that both the ancestors and Confucius were being treated as gods. Confucius was called by the Chinese word that the missionaries used for saint, thus making the, price, the precise meaning of that word crucial. The issue involved basic elements of Chinese culture, funeral rites in a society in which honoring one's ancestors was a fundamental obligation, public ceremonies expressing submission to the emperor, and appropriate honor to the philosopher who was considered the wisest of men. The Chinese rites. The issue was several times appealed to Rome with varying results. In 1704, the Holy Office ruled against the Jesuits, a decision that was debated by theologians in Europe and that continued in effect despite occasional minor concessions. The Emperor Kangxi. 1661 to 1722, wrote to the Pope that, dis that the disputed rituals were civic in nature, not religious, and he was con incensed at what he considered an act of contempt for Chinese customs, while the Jesuits complained that their ministry was severely compromised. A bishop who undertook to enforce the decree was subjected by Kang Shi, to an inquisition that showed his ignorance of Confucian thought, after which he was expelled. A papal le legate sent to uphold the decree died under house arrest by the Portuguese at Macau, acting at the instigation of the Chinese government. The episode was a major watershed in the history of Chinese Christianity. And, it, and in retrospect, it appears that both sides in the dispute were in a sense correct. Sophisticated Chinese, such as those ministered to by the Jesuits, might have been the disputed rituals as largely symbolic, whereas for simple people, both their own ancestors and Confucius himself were gods. Half the missionaries left China after 1704, but subject to intermittent persecution, the church survived. A final papal decree in 1742 required that all missionaries take an oath not to tolerate the disputed rituals. Tibet. Missionaries had entered Tibet in the 16th century but without lasting effect. Later, the Italian Jesuit Ippolito Desideri 
who died in 1733, penetrated the almost inaccessible mountain land where he immersed himself in the culture and tried unsuccessfully for six years to convert the Buddhists. He denounced the Dalai Lama as a monstrous idol. Philippines. The Spanish brought Catholicism to the Philippine Islands, named for the Spanish king, in the mid-16th century. The church flourished there from the beginning, with Manila serving, in a sense, as the ecclesiastical. But the Church of the Philippines resembled the Church of Latin America more than, of, more than that of the Far East, since Spain ruled the islands outright rather than depending on trading concessions. Something like the feudal system of land holding was set up and an intense native piety developed that as in Latin America incorporated many pagan elements. Missionary expansion, developments in missions, propaganda fidei, the Holy See regarded missionary activity as of the highest importance and the office of propaganda fidel, spread, spreading the faith, was established in 1622 to oversee missionary activity all over the world. The European powers claimed control over the church in the colonial lands so that the king of Portugal, for example, insisted on the right of approving bishops in India. To counteract this, propaganda created the new office of Beaker Apostolic, a bishop who had jurisdiction over a mission territory directly under the Holy See, but did not hold title to a diocese. The 19th century. Toward the end of the 18th century, the mission suffered severe decline everywhere because of the suppression of the Jesuits in 1773 and the disruptions of the French Revolution and Napoleonic period. A dramatic missionary revival was part of the general religious revival after 1815. In the first half of the 19th century, almost 50 new missionary communities were founded in Europe. Native clergy. Gregory XVI, although he had been a cloistered Camaldolese monk, had also been prefect of propaganda, and he had a strong interest in the missions, as did all the popes who followed him. In the 20th, 20th century, Benedict XV strongly reiterated the policies the Holy See had favored almost since the beginning of modern missionary activity. The recruitment of native clergy and urging the missionaries to identify with the native people more than with their own countries. Pius XI appointed a lowercase Indian bishop, personally consecrated the first native Chinese bishops, and appointed the first native Japanese bishop. In order to coordinate missionary activity, he centralized the apostolate, including the dispersal of funds under the propaganda. Monasteries. The missionary presence was not only on the level of the active apostolate, Contemplative monasteries and convert, convents were founded in a number of mission countries. Their purpose not to make converts directly, but to pray for conversions and to serve as examples of the spiritual power of the faith. Finances. Whereas earlier, missions had been supported either by religious orders or by European or by European governments. In the new missionary era, the entire church was made conscious of her responsibility. The French laywoman Yen Pauline Jaricot, who died in 1862, founded the Society for the Propagation of the Faith 
to collect small amounts of money from a large number of people on a regular basis. Other groups also began collecting funds. The whole world. The great missionary revival left almost no part of the globe untouched, as for the first time in history, missionaries were realistically able to obey Christ's command to preach the gospel to all nations. By 1875, there were 6,000 missionaries throughout the world, a disproportionate number of whom were from France. In 1890, there were only 275 native priests in Asia and Africa. But by 1900, there were 7,000, although there were still no native vicars, apostolic, or bishops. Colonialism. Missionaries were considered part of their mother country's civilizing process and to some extent necessarily depended on the protection of their governments. But the link between missionary activity and colonialism was tenuous. Tre French missionaries, for example, did not wish to carry out the policies of anti-clerical governments at home. And they, and they sometimes clash with colonial officials. For the first time, Catholic missionaries also found themselves in competition with Protestants, who had belatedly embraced the idea of the conversion of the world. India. Except for the region around Goa, the church presence in India was extremely weak at the beginning of the 19th century but then began to revive. The Portuguese government continued to exercise control over the hierarchy, leading the Holy See to set up several vicariates independent of the Archbishop Bishop of Goa. Strenuous efforts were made to recruit a native clergy, and catechisms and other necessary books were translated into the Tamil language. Native religious communities were established, and, then, and when one such order of sisters refused to teach girls of lower case, a second community was founded expressly for that purpose. By 1870, there were a million Catholics in India, although the church remained weak in the north. On the whole, India is perhaps the most religious culture in the world in which both Hinduism and Islam continue to exert a significant influence. Christians were officially tolerated, but are often harassed and subject to mob violence. There are abundant religious vocations. Japan. After Western gunboats unbidden entered Japanese ports in the 1850s, some Japanese recognized that Western technological superiority was the key to power, even to survival, and in a dramatic reversal of the draconian policies of the previous 250 years, Japan suddenly opened itself to the outside world. In the next decade, a conspiracy of younger men effected the Meiji Restoration, named after an imperial title, by making use of the emperor's semi-divine authority to begin adapting the material civilization of the West, even including its clothes and architecture. Openness to the West, the new rulers reluctantly recognized, required freedom for Christian missionaries who soon began entering Japan in significant numbers all the conversions remained rather sparse as, as a vicariate was created, created in 1876. The Hidden Church. In one of the most remarkable uh, episodes in the entire history of the church, French missionaries discovered a small number of secret Catholics living around Nagasaki a people who had been preserving their faith without priests for over 200 years. The Meiji government 
first arrested those survivors but released them after appeals from their European powers. These secret Christians recognized the missionaries on the basis of oral traditions concerning the Virgin Mary and the birth of Jesus and the fact that Jesus lived for 33 years and died on the cross. They had been baptizing their own children and knew the teaching that an act of perfect contrition would remove all sins without priestly absolution. Education. Although the religion of only a very small minority, Catholicism played some role in Japanese life. In the early 20th century, German Jesuits opened Sophia University on Tokyo, in Tokyo, which became one of the most respected educational institutions in the country, although it did not engage in active proselytization. Shintoism. In the 20th century, the government opposed Buddhism and promoted patriotic Shintoism. As Japanese nationalism and militarism grew more intense in the period between the world wars, some Catholics had qualms of conscience about participating in ceremonies to honor the war dead, fearing that this involved a pagan religion. After investigation, propaganda in 1939 allowed such participation, thereby in effect rescinding the decrees against the Chinese rites that had been issued in the, er the 18th century. World War II On the eve of World War, World War II, the 100,000 Japanese Catholics were shepherded by native bishops. But all foreign missionaries were ordered to leave the country. Not all complied. The city of Nagasaki, the historic, historic center of Japanese Catholicism, was one of the targets of the American atomic bomb. Takashi Nagai, a convert to Catholicism and survivor of the blast, lived in the rubble of the ruined city, dying of radiation, radiation, poisoning and advocating the healing of his people through the renunciation of military and reconciliation with the Allies. He came to be respected by both Catholic and non-Christian Japanese as a national hero. A Secular Culture After the war, Japan, perhaps because of American pressure, allowed greater religious freedom than any other non-Western country. And there was a wave of conversions to Catholicism. But Japan also took on the characteristics of a modern secular culture, pragmatic and materialistic in its outlook, and seemingly uninterested in religion so that the number of Catholics never went above half a million. China. In China, the elite gradually lost interest in Western science and hence in Western missionaries. There were intermittent persecutions, although mi missionaries continued to arrive, as they would soon do to Japan, the European powers after 1840 forced the imperial government of China to grant substantial concessions in return for trade, including treaty ports and other territories semi-independent of Chinese rule, where missionaries could work freely under the armed protection of the European powers. By 1870, there were 400,000 Chinese Catholics. The end of the empire. By the end of the century, the old empire was tottering, while the authority of Confucianism was weakened by the European incursions. Unlike in Japan, the movement for change owed much to missionary influence. But Christianity in China was, was thereby identified with the most blatant kind of European imperialism. And Christians 
were the inevitable targets of anti-foreign movements. Hostility. Even works of charity could be grounds for hostility. Because of the ancient custom of leaving unwanted based babies, mostly girls, to die of exposure, nuns took abandoned infants into their orphanages, but they were then sometimes accused of using the babies for body parts. The nuns also drew hostility for opposing the custom of painful binding girls' feet to achieve the smallness that was considered attractive. Martyrs. There were a number of Christian martyrs, and on several occasions, British and French troops invaded the country to put down rebellions and to enforce freedom for missionary activities. With the support of the imperial government, over 30,000 Catholics were, were killed in the Boxer Rebellion of 1900, so-called because its organizers practiced the martial arts. The failure of the rebellion soon led to revolution and to the disposition of the, latter, the last emperor in 1912 by which time Western secularism had made inroads among Chinese intellectuals. Growth. In 1926, Pius XI consecrated six native Chinese bishops in Rome. The next year, a Catholic university was opened in Beijing, and monasticism flourished. On the eve of World War II, there were, other, there were over 3 million Catholics in China, including a number of native priests and religious. A remarkable story was that of the Chinese foreign minister, Lu Cheng Chang, who died in 1949, who married a Belgian lady, converted to Catholicism, became a Benedictine monk after his wife's death, and was eventually elected abbot of a monastery in Belgium. World War II, Catholic religious were conducting over 9,000 Chinese elementary schools at the beginning of World War II. But during the 1920s, civil wars erupted in China among various regional warlords. An organized nationalist movement under Chiang Kai-shek, um, they who died in 1975 for the most part supported Christianity, and an organized insurgent communist movement other Mao Zedong, the, um, uh, Mao Zedong, who died in 1976, was anti-religious. The Japanese conquest of China during the 1930s brought, brought great hardships in which some Catholics played heroic resistance roles. Communism. After the war, the church quickly revived. Half the clergy were Chinese, more missionaries began to arrive, and in 1946, Archbishop Thomas Tien of Pe Peking, Be Beijing, they, uh, died, who died in 1967, a divine word father, became the first East Asian cardinal. But with the triumph of Mao's communists in 1949, severe persecution began. Within a few years, some missionaries, such as the American Marinol Bishop James A. Walsh, who died in 1981, were sent to prison for long terms, and all others were expelled. Many Catholics were killed. Many more were imprisoned. And Tien and others went into exile. While the practice of Christianity was never officially outlawed, the government sought to break its back. A favored tactic was to gather a village together and accuse its priests of numerous crimes, encouraging his parishioners to heap yet further condemnations on him. In the end, he was usually killed along with those parishioners who failed to co cooperate in his trial. The Patriotic Church 
1957, the communist government established a patriotic church made up of Catholics who professed loyalty to the state and allowed the state to approve their bishops. While members of the underground church refused such cooperation and remained subject to persecution. Several bishops cooperated in the establishments of the patriotic church, perhaps thinking that it would be a means of continuing to provide sacraments for the people. However, when those bishops began consecrating other bishops who were appointed by the government without papal approval, schism, schism resulted. During the worst period of Mao's terror, even the patriotic church was persecuted. All the conditions began to improve after his death. By 2010, the government was to some extent cooperating with the Vatican in the appointment of bishops, although there were still serious tensions. Korea Catholicism came to Korea in a unique way. When in, 19, in 1789, a Korean diplomat, Yi Shung Hoon, was converted by Catholic priests in China. He returned home and quickly made other converts who, based on their slight knowledge of the early church, elected a bishop and several priests who began celebrating Mass even though they were not ordained. When they discovered their error, they imported a Chinese priest, Blessed James Xiao Weninu, to be their pastor. He was sheltered by a wealthy widow, Blessed Columba Kang Wen Suk Kim, until she, Xiao Wen Mo, and Yi Xiong Hun were discovered and executed in 1801. Missionaries were sent from France, but persecution was severe with 8,000 Catholics put to death in a single episode. A modest recovery occurred in the later 19th century when France undertook to protect the Catholic missions in what eventually became a predominantly Protestant country. North Korea fell under brutal communist oppression after World War II, and persecution there was often savage. On a visit to Korea in 1984, Pope John Paul II canonized 103 out of an estimated 10,000 Korean martyrs, the first such ceremony ever held outside the Vatican. Vietnam. The, Indochi the, Indochina, the Indochina, the peninsula, Vietnam. The Indochina, the peninsula on which Vietnam, among other countries, is found, missions were in a, rela in a rela relatively healthy state at the beginning of the 19th century, demonstrated by the fact that Catholics there remained faithful in the face of a ferocious persecution that lasted for 50 years after 1820. The French subsequently established hegemony in the region, and Catholics, although a small minority, played an important role in the society. After the Second World War, having been freed from the Japanese, France Indochina erupted in rebellion against the mother country. When the French finally withdrew, the United States undertook to defeat the insurgents, many of whom were communists. At the time, there were almost 3 million Vietnamese Catholics, mainly in the South, ruled by the President Ngo Dinh Diem, who died in 1963, a Catholic whom the rebels accused of being a Western puppet. The United States first connived at Diem's murder, then abandoned the war altogether, which led to the inevitable triumph of the communist North and the severe persecution of Catholics, which continued intermittently into the next century. The Philippines. The Philippines were lost to Spain in the Spanish-American War of 1898 and became an American protectorate. 
that in turn provoke a full-scale native rebellion, part of which involved the schematic Philippine Independent Church. There was a good deal of resentment toward the Franciscans because they were owned they owned great estates and, uh, and the American government acquiesced in the seizure and the distribution of those lands. For a time, the church in the Philippines was governed by bishops from the United States, but gradually a native hierarchy was established. After the World War II, the, the United States belatedly kept its promise of restoring Philippine independence and as in Latin America, the church often played a crucial role in politics. Cardinal Jaime Sin of Manila, who died in 2005, rallied hundreds of thousands of people for prayers and peaceful demonstrations against the tyrannical regime of Ferdinand Marcos, who died in 19, um, um, who reigned on from 1965 to 1986. Massive outpourings of people caused, caused Marcos to flee the country and brought the Pius Corazon Aquino to power from 1986 to 1992. The Philippines, 80% per 80 percent of whose people are Catholics, remains by far the largest Catholic country in Asia with a relatively high rate of church attendance, over half and an abundance of religious vocations. The Near East. While the majority of Catholics in the Near East were members of unique rights, official protection by the French government allowed Latin Rite missionaries to become active in the 19th century. Napoleon III once intervened militarily in Lebanon after a massacre of Christians by Muslims. Because the Muslims had shown themselves extremely resistant to conversion, missionaries in the Near East settled on the strategy of making their presence known through works of charity and education so that over time, the Christian spirit might penetrate the culture. Numerous hospitals and orphanages were established, and the Jesuits in particular, particular founded several colleges. World War I brought an end to French protection, and after that, there was intermittent persecution of the church, especially by Turkey. North Africa. North Africa had been one of the great centers of the early church. But the Christian presence, except in the northeast corner of the continent, was wiped out by the successive barbarian and Muslim invasions of the Dark Ages. Jesuits went to North America, Africa in the late 16th century and succeeded, succeeded in converting a king of Abyssinia, but his successors repudiated his action, and the missionaries were all martyred. Beginning also in the 16th century, there was some Catholic presence in sub-Saharan Africa because of trading posts set up mainly by the Portuguese. But these were swept away during the chaotic period of 1773 to 1815. Visionaries began to return to Africa with the colonial conquest of the 19th century. France conquered Algeria in 1830, but the anti-clericalism of the liberal monarchies imposed restrictions on missionary activity in the colony. For diplomatic reasons, the government encouraged Islam even as it discouraged Catholicism. La Vigeri. But then Archbishop Abigeri of Algiers defied Napoleon III and embark on a vigorous program of practical charity and evangelization. Seeing Algeria as the gateway to the African interior, Lavigeri La founded the White Sisters and the White Fathers, who first worked among the North Africans, 
speaking Arabic and wearing white robes and red African style hats. They had minimal success, although the church remained an important presence through her charitable and educational institutions. The Holy Ghost Fathers were founded by Jacob Lieberman, who died in 1852, a convert from Judaism, specifically to minister to oppressed blacks in Africa and the Caribbean. To further this ministry, they encourage native vocations. Foucault. St. Charles de Foucault, who died in uh, 1916, was a French soldier who lived a dissolute life but underwent conversion and entered the Trappist in North Africa. Recognizing the missionary's lack of success, he attempted to bear witness to the gospel by, leading, by living as a hermit on the edge of the desert and ministering to the poor. He was regarded by the Muslim Berber tribesmen as a holy man, but, but made no converts. Later, he moved his hermitage even further into the interior of the continent. However, with the First World War raging in Europe, he was murdered by tribesmen who accused him of being a French spy. The little brothers and sisters of the Sacred Heart were founded later in accord with the rule he had drawn up in expectation of attracting companions. Africa Missionaries gradually ventured southward into African regions, previously little known to Europeans, to some extent dependent on the authority of the Portuguese, French, and Belgians who laid claim to those territories. Africa presented its own obstacles and opportunities for evangelization. Traditional African culture was deeply religious in that the reality of the supernatural was taken very seriously, but often in the form of belief in sorcerers and devils who were thought to be very powerful and in need of placating. Obstacles. The practice of polygamy was common in many places, and there was no tradition of celibacy. In addition to native cults, Islam also was strong in the African interior, where the white fathers fought against both polygamy and the still flourishing slave trade. A number of the earliest missionaries were massacred, even when protected by companies of papal guards whom La Bijeri recruited. In 1887 to 1880, in 1885 to 1887, the king of Buganda, now the modern Uganda, ordered the brutal execution of 80 Catholics, including some of his own young pages who refused to submit to sodomy. Saint Charles Luanga and his companions were dismembered and burned, the first martyrs of sub-Saharan Africa. Growth. The faith in Africa spread with some rapidity, and the missionaries adopted a method previously used in the Chinese missions, that is, training lay Catholics to work in remote rural villages between visits by priests. The first native bishop was appointed in 1939, and the first cardinal, Lauren Rugambua, who died in 1997, of Bukeba, Tanzania, in 1961. The end of colonialism. The end of colonialism in Africa after World War II led in some places to a rejection of Christianity as an imperialist imposition, even though the church generally opposed such practices as apartheid in South Africa. The persecution of the church by some of the new governments, as in the Congo, often had the effect of stimulate, stimulating a revival of Catholicism. The most severe persecution had been in the Sudan, where for decades, 
that Muslim government has in effect tried to exterminate Christianity. Some of the newer African nations, Rwanda, Burundi, were split by bitter, even genocidal civil wars between different tribal groups. Catholics, including clergy and religious, were inevitably drawn in those conflicts, often as victims or as ministers to the victims, but sometimes as perpetrators of atrocities. Oceania. In some ways, the starkest challenge to mission activity in the 19th century was in the islands of Oceania, which were hitherto almost unknown to Europeans and which manifested a wide variety of cultures. A number of missionaries were summarily slaughtered, some eaten by cannibals upon landing on an unfamiliar island. Hawaii. When the first French missionaries landed in the Sandwich Islands, Kingdom of Hawaii, they were forcibly expelled by men who were functioning both as traders and as Protestant missionaries. When the Queen obtained the help of the French to allow the priest to return, there was an international incident which involved armed conflict between Catholics and Protestants. Dungeon of Molokai. Few saints in the history of the church have received both in his own lifetime and later the fame and admiration of Saint Damien, so Joseph de Boster, who died in 1889. The Flemish priest of the Order of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary volunteered to work among society's ultimate outcasts. The lepers confined to the Hawaiian island of Molokai, knowing he would never be allowed to leave the island and would most likely die of the disease. In the face of the vile smells and hideous bodily deformations caused by Hansen's disease, Damien was practically the only person of his time willing actually to touch lepers, whom he nursed in their squalid huts and eventually prepared for burial, even digging their graves. He farmed and with his own hands built chapels, hospitals, and houses. Through preaching, confession, the Mass, and Eucharistic adoration, he attempted to instill courage and hope in people who were sunk in despair and who often compensated by orgies. Confined to the island, he made his own confession by shouting his sins to a priest on board a ship in the harbor. His superiors considered Damien impetuous and full-heartedly and were suspicious of the worldwide publicity he inspired. They were not the only ones. A, prost a Protestant minister in Hawaii wrote a def defaming letter about Damien which was subsequently published in a Sydney Presbyterian newspaper and then famously rebutted by the non-Catholic author Robert Louis Stevenson. Marian Cope Eventually, reliable helpers began to arrive on Molokai, and after Damien's death, one of those, the German-American nun Saint Marian Cope, who died in 1918, helped turn the mission into a flourishing center of both physical and spiritual ministration. Latin America. The great irony of Latin America is the fact that while in theory it is the most thoroughly Catholic region of the globe, it has always been mission territory due to the chronic shortage of native priests. During the 1950s, some dioceses in the United States began to send their priests there because of the death of native clergy. Economic problems. Perhaps the root of troubled history was the sur survival of a system that was in many ways still feudal with great wealth in the hands of a relatively few large landowners 
and the majority of the people poor peasants. Economic modernization did not necessarily lead to improvement as peasants who moved to the cities as laborers were forced to accept low wages and face often chronic unemployment. Historically, the church in Latin America tended to support conservative governments that were tolerant of religion and allowed the church influence in critical areas of society such as education. This policy, however, required virtually ignoring the social doctrines of the church until after World War II. The bishops began cautiously to endorse economic and social change and found it increasingly necessary to criticize governments. Land reform became a fundament, fundamental issue, although seldom resolved. Dictators. But there was only a weak tradition of liberal reform in Latin America, so that the path of change was seldom orderly and peaceful, and often erupted into open violence between the forces of order and the forces of change. Typically, as with the quasi-fascist dictator Juan Perón of Argentina, who died in 1974, a strong ruler came to power with the support of the military, only to be later deposed by the same military with all democratic rights suspended. Cuba. Cuba was one of the least religious of Latin American countries. The bishops attempted to remain neutral as pressure for change built up, and they were at first cautiously receptive to the movement of Fidel Castro, which took power in the revolution of 1959. Castro, however, soon proclaimed Cuba as communist state and began imposing severe, severe restrictions on the church that still remained in place half a century later. Frey, in a unique episode in Latin American history during the 1960s, the Christian Democratic Party in Chile, under Eduardo Frey, who died in 1982, was able to effect social and economic change without based to some extent on Catholic social principles, although the basic problem of land reform was not solved. But praise in the demonstration that change was possible led to demands for still swifter and more radical change. And after he left office, a Marxist dictatorship took of power only to be overthrown by a right-wing dictatorship supported by the military. Martyrs. The entrenched forces in Latin America were often ruthless, as were the unofficial death squads in Argentina that during the 1980s murdered hundreds of people suspected of opposing the government. In El Salvador, at different times, Archbishop Oscar M R Romero, who died in 1980, six Jesuit, Jesuit uh, teachers and four nuns from the United States were murdered because of their opposition to the regime. On the other side, leftist guerrillas espousing Marxist ideas also employed assassination and other terrorist methods. Costa Rica. Costa Rica remained one of the most prosperous and stable Latin American countries and also one of a handful of countries in the world that continued to recognize, recognize Catholicism as its official religion. Protestant missions. After World War II, various Protestant groups began to make Latin America a center of missionary activity on the grounds that the prevalent Catholicism did not represent the true gospel. Over the ensuing decades, Protestants had modest success because of the priest shortage and because popular Catholic piety was vulnerable to the charge of superstition. Mission growth. 
Altogether, the number of Catholics in Asia grew from 12.5 million to 121 million between 1900 and 2010, and from 6.5 million to 128 million in Africa during the same period. Around 1965, the great modern era of missionary activity came to an abrupt end, partly because of the crisis that followed the Second Vatican Council, partly because some of the mission churches had become self-sustaining. Africa, the Philippines, and Ija in particular now began sending priests to Western countries almost as reverse missionaries. The end of Lecture 12. Bye! Salamat po, overtime. <laughs> Salamat, ang ganda. Salamat. Sorry, okay, very good. Thank you very much, Lilith. Uh, sorry, medyo mahaba talaga. Pero we really, we really have to finish that. Pero part. maganda, yung pala ibig sabihin ng ends of the earth. <laughs> okay. So, At saka natapos po. na, natapos na, ends of the earth na rin. <laughs> Joke All right. Po. Sige, sige. Thank you very much. So, um, next time po, uh, tingnan, tingnan natin meron pa isang mag, uh, mag present chat. Ha? Okay, sandali lang po. Wala nang tanong nga, ha? Wala na muna. <laughs> <laughs>